Luke chapter 1, verses 68 to 79. This is the song of Zechariah, or Zechariah's prophecy. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people, and because he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy towards our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, and to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and in righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. And so today this brings us to the third song that clusters around the nativity story. In the opening chapters of Luke's gospel, it is Zechariah's song of hope, his hymn of hope. His entire hymn is looking forward in hope. Hope is the great expectation that characterizes his song, and he's looking forward in hope for the assured fulfillment of God's promises both to Abraham and to David of how God, through the birth of Jesus, the conception and birth of Jesus, is fulfilling in Mary's womb, he's fulfilling both the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. And these are what the Old Testament saints had longed for and hoped for for 2,000 years. That was Dr. John Fonville and his sermon from 2017, The Song of Zechariah. Welcome to another episode of Gospel Gal. I am Marissa Namir, Gospel Gal, and in today's episode, I will be joined by my friend and co-host Joy Dudley. It is Advent 2021. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the Incarnation and the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is to come. We're looking at the promises that are fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ and the blessed hope of our future in him. Genesis 3.15 I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Genesis 17, 1 through 7. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Second Samuel 7, 8 through 17. Now this is what you are to say to my servant David. This is what the Lord of hosts says. I took you from the pasture and from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed your enemies before you. I will make a name for you like that of the greatest in the land. I will establish a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live and not be disturbed again. 
evildoers will not afflict them as they have done ever since the day I ordered judges to be over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. When your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with a human rod and with blows from others. But my faithful love will never leave him as I removed it from Saul. I removed him from your way. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. Nathan spoke all these words this entire vision to David. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered the oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of the oppressor just as you did on the day of Midian. For the trampling boot of battle and bloodied garments of war will be burned as a fuel on the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Luke 2, 8 through 13. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. We understand and believe that Jesus was a real historical man. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin to fulfill prophecy as a serpent crusher from Genesis 3, the seed of Abraham and the root of David. And he is for us the long-awaited Messiah, mediator, and advocate. We believe and can have no doubt that he is all our salvation and peace with God. He has reconciled us to God by his perfect one and only sacrifice. He has actively and passively fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf and ever lives to make intercession for us. So the creed tells us, I believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Heidelberg Catechism 35 explains, what do you confess when you say that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? The eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took upon himself true human nature from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary through the working of the Holy Spirit. 
Thus, he is also the true seed of David and like his brothers in every respect, yet without sin. That's incredible. Incredible. I don't, <laughs> it's amazing. Ursinus says that there are two benefits resulting from the holy conception and nativity of Christ. First, the confirmation of our faith that he is the mediator. And secondly, the consolation that we are justified before God through him. The reason of this arises from the fact that he cannot be the mediator between God and man, who is not himself very man and perfectly righteous, and who is not united with the word. It behooved the mediator to be by nature true God and man, that he might preserve the salvation purchased for us. For such a high priest became a who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Hebrews 7.26. What, therefore, is the meaning of this article, I believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary? First, I believe that this natural Son of God was made true man in a miraculous manner, and that he is one Christ, having two natures, the divine and human, joined together by a personal union, and that he was sanctified by the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And secondly, I believe that he is such true God and true man, and yet but one Christ, and that he was sanctified from his mother's womb, that he might redeem and sanctify me, which he could not do unless sanctification were effected in him. And that I have the right of the adoption of the sons of God for the sake of this, his son conceived and born in the manner just described. Do you have any thoughts about that, Marissa? First John 1, verses 1 through 4, and then 14 through 16. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then skipping down to verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Well, one of the first things that has come to mind when reading that Q&A that describes how Christ's conception benefits us is that idea that all of Christ's life was for us and in our place. And that includes the fact that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit which means that his innocence in his conception covers my sin in which I was conceived too. So even his conception is for all of our sakes. That's incredible to think about. And his conception ensures our new birth as well. Yeah. Thanks be to God. What an unspeakable gift. I just was thinking that it reinforces the idea that our sanctification is in him too. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we have a real Messiah who came, the prophesied one. The scripture verses that we've read today demonstrate that he is a fulfillment. He lived a perfect life of obedience on our behalf so that we can have the confidence that the Lord accepts us as fully perfected in him. Not that we're perfected in this life, but in terms of our justification. It never gets any better than it is right now. So when we receive him by faith, then we have his perfect righteousness imputed to us. He lived the life that we could never live, died the death that we deserved, was buried and rose again for our justification. So thanks be to God for sending his son. And we remember all of us in his incarnation. But we also have something to look forward to during this time of Advent. Joy and I just wanted to bring to you this great message of salvation that has been given to us, but we are living in the already and the not yet. In other words, 
Chris was prophesied. He came. He is currently interceding for us as our mediator. But we have something to look forward to. The end of the creed says that he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. And Joy has something to share from the Heidelberg in regard to that. Heidelberg Q&A 52. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? Answer. In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation, but he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. Amen. Thanks be to God. And thank you for joining another episode of Gospel Gal. We trust that this Advent episode has been a gospel blessing to you and that you will share this episode on your social media with your family and friends. So as always, we bid you gospel blessings. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.